Good afternoon, everyone. Before I start my talk, <coughs> I'd just like to say that this is a scientific talk, but not in the conventional sense. There is going to be quite a lot of where I envision cancer treatment to be going. So I've decided to start every talk I give now with this slide, which is truly a sobering statistic. One in two men and one in three women are going to get cancer in the United States. There will be three parts to my talk. Why um, did I decide to study this unpronounceable disease, myelodysplastic syndrome or MDS, which some of my patients now say that MDS stands really for my disease stinks. <laughs> What do we know so far about this disease and where are we heading? So when I was 28 years old and uh, just finished my fellowship at, of course, 100 years ago at Roswell Park Cancer Institute, I had a patient who was similar to me in age, beautiful African-American woman who presented with acute myeloid leukemia. But the story she gave was very peculiar that two years prior to this, she had developed, she had become pregnant with twins. And during her pregnancy, she acquired a fetish to smell gasoline. So every day of her pregnancy, she would walk out to the corner gas station, buy a dime's worth of gasoline and sit and sniff it all day. At the end of nine months, she delivered a set of healthy twin girls. But then six months later, she developed myelodysplastic syndrome, which rapidly developed into acute myeloid leukemia. And that's when I saw her. So we treated her. She went into remission briefly, then relapsed. And for her terminal illness, she asked me to admit her to the hospital. And every morning when I would go to make rounds, I would see that she's writing furiously in journal. Now remember that during the time that she was in complete remission, I was seeing her regularly in my clinic and because we were very similar in age, we became really close and very good friends. One day I got up enough courage to ask her, Jackie, what is it you are writing? And the answer she gave me changed the course of my life. She said, Dr. Raza, I'm writing letters that I want my twin girls to open on each of their birthdays. She said, I've reached their 12th. Keep me alive till I reach their 21st birthday. And I couldn't. And when she died, I went home. I told my husband that we should have been studying this disease not when she presented with acute myeloid leukemia, but when it was a pre-leukemia or myelodysplastic syndrome, because probably the genetic lesions are easier to understand. Since that day, I have never looked back. My husband, of course, said, why nobody's ever going to give you a grant. Nobody will fund you. Why do you want to study this disease? And now you know how much I listened to him because I've never done anything else but just <laughs> devoted my life to MDS. <clears throat> the second decision I made was at that point that I'm not going to study this disease in mice and rats or in petri dishes. I'm going to study freshly obtained human cells. And so I started a tissue repository at that time which now is the richest in the world. We have 50,000 samples from thousands of MDS and AML patients. And we can literally with a one click efficiency, go in and look at how much DNA and RNA and what samples do we have and all the clinical information that goes with it. So that is about uh, why I did it and the importance of having tissue to study on patients. So what is this disease? Myelodysplastic syndrome is a pre-leukemia that starts in the bone marrow and it can go on to become leukemia in a third of the patients. Now bone marrow is an organ in our body whose job is to make blood cells. The way it does so is that the marrow contains a certain number of stem cells. 
each of which can multiply and undergo maturation so that we have production of red cells, white cells, platelets. And do you know that every day a trillion cells are made by the bone marrow, few stem cells giving birth to a trillion cells every day that are headed for the blood. And that's what happens then, the, uh, it enters blood. What happens in myelodysplastic syndrome is that something goes wrong with one of those stem cells so that a mutation like Dr. Rabadan before me mentioned and now it has become a cancerous, a malignant stem cell and its main property is that it divides faster than its counterpart so that the marrow gets filled with daughters of its cell. So it undergoes in other words clonal expansion. But in MDS, the thing that's important and differentiates it from acute leukemia is that the cells can still undergo maturation. But what happens is, before they enter the blood, many of them die prematurely. So now, the, what you have is lots and lots of cells in the bone marrow, but paucity of cells in the blood. So patients will now develop anemia, thrombocytopenia, and um, uh, leukopenia. Another step that can happen is a second mutation can occur in this MDS stem cell so that it stops undergoing maturation now. And if it doesn't undergo maturation, then you can see that all the marrow has is lots and lots of blasts and they start coming out in the blood. And this is the situation that we call acute myeloid leukemia or AML. Dr. Bert Vogelstein has said um, that <coughs> revolutions in cancer can be summed up in a single sentence, that cancer is a genetic disease. So using our tissue repository in 2011, we working with the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute, we published a paper in the New England Journal of Medicine that showed for the first time that mutations in any one of the five genes listed here is associated with a compromised survival. Another thing that we showed more recently along with Dr. Rabadan and my brilliant scientific colleague at Columbia University, Dr. Stevrula Kusteni, whose lab did this primary work in mice to show that if there is a mutation in the osteoblasts, in the gene called beta catenin in mice, they develop MDS and acute leukemia. So we wanted to see what happens in humans and we were able to show using again our tissue repository that in fact 38% of patients with MDS can also have overexpression of beta catenin. So this immediately then suggested translational component, meaning how can we use this biologic insight and translate it into improved and novel therapies for our patient. And what was suggested was that if beta catenin is high, then one of the breaks on it can be retinoic acid. You see the break being put here. What is retinoic acid? Vitamin A. Can we treat patients with vitamin A? And that's ATRA, all trans retinoic acid. So instead of chemotherapy, can we treat patients with a vitamin? So without having to wait for big clinical trials, I went ahead and we measured beta catenin with Dr. Kusteni. And then those patients who had a high beta catenin, we started giving them ATRA. Lo and behold, Every patient I gave it to has had a good response and how fortunate we are that one of my patients is here in the audience and has agreed to uh, go ahead and address you for a couple of minutes, Mr. Peter Massiello. Thank you, Thank you so much. Just a couple of last uh, two concepts I'd like to, sit, to uh, describe and then I'll be done is that uh, cancer is not a disease that, uh, ex that in which the cells expand and undergo clonal evolution, but they're also always changing. So let's say uh, if we follow one cell becoming a cancerous cell and then 
giving birth to lots and lots of cancerous cells. At the same time, it will also give birth to certain daughter cells which have varying passenger mutations. So the driver mutation, founder mutation may be the same in each of these cells, but acquired passenger mutations would be different. Let's say in such a patient, we come in with treatment in any cancer, this is true. We treat and then if the cells are sensitive, they will go down. But the response will only last as long as it takes for the next clone of cells to start wearing their ugly head and start undergoing <coughs> clonal evolution. So there's a sequential activation of subclones that comes. In other words, cancer is not just a static one-time disease that you can find targeted therapy for. So my uh, tissue repository has been helpful once again. In this patient, we have bone marrows uh, over the last four years. We looked at mutations, expanding. Uh, no sooner do we take care of one, that the second one starts to come and we know the third one will be this. So my message is be wise and individualize therapy. How do you individualize when you have more than one mutation? So here's a patient who had nine mutations. Fortunately, I'm working with an amazing computational group that were able to put together this whole uh, process of nine mutations, what are the pathways they affect, and then came up with two drugs I can treat the patient with. One of these drugs is simvastatin, which is a cholesterol lowering statin, and another is tofacitinib, which is used in arthritis. So you're now treating cancer with a drug for cholesterol uh, and a drug for arthritis. So I gave these to the patient. Here's another one patient with four mutations on exome sequencing of her genome and then on computational analysis, a drug that is taking care of diabetes combined with Celebrex, which is an anti-inflammatory drug. And again, this patient treated and having a response. So the idea is that what we need is to individualize treatment serially for the patients because of the clonal evolution. The last thing I want to say is that my um, one of uh, the women I admired greatly, Ms. Nora Efron, who died of myelodysplastic syndrome, had uh, made <coughs> a list of things she would not miss in the afterlife like dry skin, Clarence Thomas and the role of women in films. Um, if I was going to make such a list on top of my list would be applying for grants. <laughs> And the reason I say this is because you heard, I started with the statistic that said uh, that basically uh, one in two men and one, three, one in three women will get cancer. So if I was given all the money in the world without applying for a grant, what would be my dream project? Well, art is I and science uh, has to be done together. Van Gogh could stand and paint the starry nights by himself, but we really need a dream team. And we are very fortunate here at Columbia. And because of the tissue repository also, I can go outside of Columbia and have collaborations with my colleagues um, at Harvard or NCI or MD Anderson and so on and so forth. Um, so the first job is to create a dream team. And the second is exactly what I said. Try to individualize therapy in the individual patients serially, stop studying mice, stop studying petri dishes, really bring the latest technology to the bedside. Study the individual patient directly and try to use what we have learned for the benefit of the patient. So be wise and, and, and individualize serially. And my last slide just simply shows you the shocking statistic that 0.1% of the country's budget goes to uh, re research in a disease which is affecting half the men and a third of the women. And where is the rest of the money going? Really in defense and social security and Medicare and Medicaid, which is good, but the problem is we need to really consider um, a, a, a re-diverting of funds to improving cancer research so that young people like you, all of you in this room, 
are encouraged and excited to join the foray instead of being depressed and discouraged from all the horror stories they hear from their mentors about grants not getting funded. Uh, when I came to Roswell Park Cancer Institute as a young 24 year old medical student, this is what I saw on the walls of uh, Roswell Park. If I had a choice between a walk on the moon and curing one life from cancer, I would never look at the moon again. Thank you.